Welcome to all of you here and those joining us online. We are here today to discuss a really important topic on global ESG standards. I'm Ramya. I oversee the ESG initiative at the World Economic Forum, and I'm joined by an eminent panel today. To my left is Emmanuel Faber. You are the chair of the International Sustainability Standards Board. Welcome. Thank you, Ramya. To Emmanuel's left, we have Brian Moynihan, CEO and the chairman of Bank of America. Thank you, Brian. And to Brian's left is Gillian Tett. You are uh, editor at large at the Financial Times, and you're also the editorial chair of the Moral Money at the Financial Times. So welcome, Gillian. So I'm going to kick off with uh, you, Emmanuel. Um, the ISSB, or the International Sustainability Standards Board, you're tasked with perhaps um, the most important effort of bringing common ESG standards in the world. And someone reminded us just a days ago that it's one of the most important innovations in accounting since almost the 14th century. So I want to turn to you and say, uh, how do you feel about this? Um, <laughs> and uh, why is this important and why should people care? Yeah. Well, thank you, Ramya. And I have to say it's a very strange feeling. You probably don't know why. but. I was in the room uh, on the 3rd of November when um, ISSB was announced at the COP26, and actually Gillian was moderating the session of the announcement at that point in time, and that's when I didn't know that it would become my job, but uh, I was approached and finally it did, and so we are not even six months later, and I'm speaking now on behalf of ISSB, it's a privilege for me. Um, I've accepted this mission because indeed I think uh, that um, complementing accounting and financial statements with uh, the ability for investors to make decisions on uh, the basis of um, issues that do matter for companies in which they invest uh, is essential. Um, if we want that, uh, in particular the climate transition, that uh, is, is going to be a risk and might be an opportunity, uh, is addressed properly uh, by businesses with enough discussions and support from their capital providers. So um, I, I think, yeah, I, I'd agree with the fact that this is groundbreaking work. I don't know, you know where to relate in the past, but um, we are certainly writing a part that's complementary to accounting uh, that is much needed. And I have to say, um, ISSB has been created in response to a call of the G20 leaders, uh, the TCFD uh, framework, of course the WEF uh, and its IBC that's been working on this and supporting and, and requesting the, the, the standardization of those topics uh, with a simple view which is that in particular climate is one climate and that's global. So we won't solve it jurisdiction by jurisdiction, company by company, industry by industry. There needs to be a global language for that. And uh, this is our mission to uh, create that global language, listening to the market needs and answering to the market needs. So um, happy to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm going to pick up on a few key things and, um, and move to you, Brian. You are not just uh, running the largest bank in America, and you're also the chair of the International Business Council under your leadership uh, and together with the collaboration of EY, KPMG, PwC and Deloitte, we've been able to put forward uh, stakeholder capitalism metrics, industry agnostic. Over 150 companies have signed up. Half of them have started reporting. So thanks to you, we've been able to demonstrate that business can move and move fast. And I'd love to hear from you now. What is your reaction to um, Emmanuel's effort in driving these standards and how are your peer CEOs reacting to it? So I think that we, we need to trace back just a hair to how we got here, which was um, a need to have across industries uh, a set of standards that could align capitalism to the sustainable development goals. So people will talk about ESG. This is stakeholder capitalism. So the shareholders in here too, you know, and so that's so it's you know, your team, your customers your shareholders in society, and that's the 50-year plus year version uh, vision of Klaus in the manifesto. So you, you, there, that's not an unsubtle distinction, because this is not ESG. This is actually how you run companies to create stakeholder capitalism and, and drive it. The second thing is we started this because of, of, of proliferation of metrics and activities and the disparity and a lack of 
uh, anybody could set the rules and say I'm a, a standard setter without a regulation around who could be a standard setter, et cetera. So we said, look, industry guys say, quit saying we can't do that. Let's say what we can do. And so we got the big four to say, grab all those standards, put them together, and come up with ones that align to the four pillars of the SDGs. And if, you can see the fellow there with the goals. If we can align capitalism to that, the SDGs, you get lots of figures, but let's say it's $6 trillion a year. Two and a half a year just for the environmental part. The total charity in the world is a trillion, given in a year's time, a trillion two. All the foundations and endowments in the world, which are wonderful, charities wonderful, a couple trillion dollars. The governments of the world are running deficits. So where's the money going to come from? Six trillion dollars every single year. It's not by our charity. It's not by our governments. It's not by our foundations. It's going to be by the private sector aligning capitalism. And when you align that, just in the case of Bank of America, we give away, we, we, our charitable donations are $500 million a year. We have a $60 billion expense base. We have 200,000 people. We have a $3 trillion balance sheet. You start throwing that at it. And now what you've done is align the entire expense base of all the actors in the world, the entire market capitalization of all the actors, the entire debt platform of all the actors, and then you can drive it. Why it's important to get it standardized from really the accounting discipline out, which is the task uh, Emmanuel has taken on, is it's got to apply to the whole economy. Otherwise, the issue will be it, the activities can migrate away. So that's one key principle, and that's why we support the establishment of what Emmanuel is going to do, and now he's got to do the work, and we would hope that he would look favorably on the work we've done, but that's his work, not ours. Uh, but we, we were very much for the establishment, and so two years ago, we started engaging for the question of establishment, and we've got to do the same thing in the U.S. We've got to bring in accounting, because once you do that, all companies have to do it. You don't have to debate whether private equity can get out of it. So. Number one, it was simplicity. Number two, it had to be all industries. Number two, you had to get people to voluntarily do it, 160 companies. Number three, you had to have it consistent with the SDGs. If we, that's why we're here at WEF and stakeholder capitalism. Number four, you had to get it applied so nobody could hide from it. And then you had to get companies to do it. And that's what we've been about for the last few years. And so that then allows you then to leverage. So where do they go next? More companies. And it becomes a thing that you can say, hey, I'm an investor, and we have a $4 trillion investment portfolio. Wait. That company's doing it, why can't you? If you can't show me the same statistics, maybe you aren't running your company in a way that would be consistent with long-term value creation for your shareholders, et cetera. And that gives the in investors, the consumers, and all the other constituencies, the bondholders, a consistent way to see across companies. And a bar, not the best company, because there's gonna be one of those and all the capital can't go to one company. The, the bar of which you're below, people shouldn't invest in you. They shouldn't have lent to. They shouldn't do business with your customer. And that's what we're trying to do. And so, you know, that's, that's where we are. More companies drive it through and then engage to help make the business-led tr uh, transition that has to occur here occur and then have people be able to understand it's occurring and hold us accountable for the occurrence. And that's where it goes for these standards. Thank you, Brian. And Jillian, um, you are one of those that write about this issue on a very, very regular basis. And I've often seen the frustration that comes from what I would call the alphabet soup of different voluntary standards. And, and you've called for, I would say, very actively, can we do it quick? Can we consolidate? Can we, can we do it fast enough? So I just want to turn to you to say, what would be your reactions to ISSB's mandate and, and your expectations in terms of how quickly can we get together a set of standards that citizens, investors, and those interested in this information can rely on. Well, thank you very much indeed, and it's great to be here today. Um, as you said, I created a platform with colleagues called Moral Money three years ago, which is a weekly or three times a week newsletter about um, sustainability. And I called it Moral Money because I was just fed up with the acronyms. And I wasn't trying to invoke any sort of sense of being a preacher, but I was trying to invoke Adam Smith and the theory of moral sentiments and get away from the alphabet soup and I was a journalist covering the credit derivatives world and credit world back in the early part of the 21st century. And I used to joke I couldn't imagine a place which had more acronyms with all the CDOs and CDS and ABCDS and all that kind of stuff. And then I found it. It's called ESG. <laughs> I used to joke that ESG should stand for eye roll, sneer, and groan. Um, that summed up how most of the journalists felt about it. But, um, you know, so I have indeed been horrified by the acronyms. 
It's very important that having lots of acronyms because it means that essentially you have an elite who speak financial Latin and no one else has a clue what they actually mean by it. Um, that was certainly true of the credit derivatives world and it's partly an issue around sustainability. People don't understand what's going on. So I salute the fact that there is now an effort to streamline the acronyms, uh, albeit by having more acronyms. Um, I often think that the ISSB should be called the ISB because it goes well with the G-fans. And if you put the ISB and the G-fans together, it sounds like a Korean boy band <laughs> and people can remember it. Um, but joking aside, I do actually salute the fact that they're trying to consolidate and streamline the acronyms into one type of accounting framework and standard is very badly needed. Um, what is attempted is absolutely remarkable. Um, I'm not sure about the 14th century analogy, but it's certainly in many ways the most striking um, reform to accounting and audit um, since probably the 1930s. Um, and it's very, very ambitious. And precisely because it's geeky and only understood by the priestly class, um, people don't realize that the idea of trying to overhaul the, not just the accounting framework, but the audit framework at the speed at which they're trying to move is absolutely remarkable. Um, you know, when I was at college, I was an anthropologist, and I used to think it was sort of tie-dye wearing activists who were going to change the world and campaign for climate change. Now I realize it's actually warrior accountants, <laughs> and being an accountant has actually suddenly become quite cool. Um, but it's remarkable. It's also, though, incredibly challenging. And, you know, you cannot underestimate the degree to which there are challenges around things like scope three, around trying to get alignment, trying to measure stuff in supply chains, particularly in parts of the world where there's very little measurement. And you also cannot underestimate the degree to which companies and corporate boards around the world, as they begin to understand what all this means in practice, there's gonna be a backlash. There already is a backlash. You're seeing it with the SEC proposals. And to me, the really interesting story, which you know most people are not following very closely, is where that backlash is going in relation to this remarkable attempt to overhaul accounting. I think you raised some really key points, and I want to go back to our panelists on this. But I would pick up on one key thing you talked about. There is an absolute need to build capacity around the new language, the grammar, and the skills around it. So one of the things under, again, Brian's leadership we've been able to do is bring together a sizable community of practitioners who are working with us as these companies start to come together to get the right site sort of data and disclosure. So that's something we are trying to sort of align with you on the agenda of capacity building. With that said, I'll go to, to you, Brian, for a quick uh, second. You spoke about alignment of capital against where we need to get to. Um, where are the investors uh, in this conversation? And the second related question to you is also what um, Jillian just referred to. There are There is a risk of different um, jurisdictions coming forward with different standards, and what would your message be to these? Uh, let, me, let me take the second quickly, and there's, there's a danger of different jurisdictions. There's a bigger danger of too much complexity and, and not being able to understand it, and we were having a, a discussion earlier, which is in order to get this right, you're going to have to have you know, $3 million revenue companies, $300 million revenue companies, $3 billion revenue companies, $30 billion revenue companies and $300 billion revenue companies all be able to do it. And so there's a risk if we start thinking about the $300 billion company come down, you, you, will be, you will overwhelm really to the heart of Gillian's point. So what do you want people to do? You want to pay, move and take action. So start from the simplest and move up. And by the way, the accounting text, the current text and all the principles behind it didn't start off with volumes that you have to read and understand. It started off as basic principles. You know, your assets your liabilities, your equity, your income statement, here's revenue, here's expense, here's how you report it. And then over the years, you know, that first in, first out, you know, all this other stuff has developed, but there, there are some simple principles. We have to start straightforward. And so the, there's two risks. One is, and Emmanuel will be much more articulate because he's in the middle of trying to do harmonization. But I think the bigger risk is to make it so complex that you then raise the risk of the rejection, and that, that's one. When you talk about alignment of capital, um, Think, think about us. We've we got I don't know, 25, 30 billion dollars in uh, uh, ESG related pa uh, funds. We have been a, helped found the um, imp uh, the uh, Rise Impact series of funds, first on impact and then on environment. We've invested in a lot of other things like that. You know, put clients' money into things like that. It, that's not really what you're talking about here. 
Do you want the $25 billion of ESG funds, or do you want the $4 trillion investment assets aligned? And it's the second one you're trying to get to. And so our research at Bank of America, that was sort of the way that I started thinking about this when, when I was asked to work on it with you and your colleagues that did a great job here. The research our team has says that if people don't score well on the types of metrics we're talking about here, and they score poorly, it's not that it outperforms as, as predictable, but the one thing is if you avoid the companies that don't score well, you avoid 95% of the bankruptcies. And so if you're a lender, an investor, or, any, or, or a, consumer, you know, a person on our wealth management platform, I can avoid the worst companies. I'm actually in good shape, and then I can work out from there. So there's an element of uh, standardization and things that happen. But the question is, we're trying to align the $4 trillion in our example, not the $25 billion. We're trying to align all capital against this, which gets out of the sidecar, the ESG fund, the specialty fund, which is great debate about, you know, going on about what they do and how they do it. You know, said, if you tell me how you invest your money, the companies tell you how they run the company, and, and the alignment will happen over time. It'll take time. It'll happen. Thank you for that, and I'll go back to you, Jalyn, on the point you made. Some of this conversation is quite technical, as you've very articulately laid out, and also what Brian's trying to distinguish is, you know, we want to bring companies and their balance sheets behind this action as opposed to necessarily the, the asset managing in the fund industry. And there is a lot of funds that claim to be ESG funds, and there is already in this confused space, we have more confusion. So what would be your thoughts around how could we make this accessible to people that actually want to understand and have transparency and try to get more discipline that companies who say what they do they say actually translate into actions? Well, I think personally one of the simplest ways to do it is to start asking companies to put carbon pricing into their activities, for example. And if you start putting a carbon price into your investment decisions or your balance sheet, um, just as you might put in a sort of interest rate projection or something like that, suddenly you begin to get um, a sense of what the company's footprint is um, on the world. And you begin to see what will also happen as and when you know, governments do start to introduce carbon prices in the future, because that almost certainly will happen, and the risks they're running. And that's a kind of simple metric or simple measure which begins to get a lot more transparency about what, say, the climate issues actually mean for your average company. Um, there is, as I said before, a communication challenge. It's not a set of ideas which is necessarily that easy to communicate to people. Um, the one, and there's also, by the way, a shortage of people who are trained to not just communicate it, but actually to um, understand it. And, you know, speaking, coming from the media world, one of the problems in looking at these issues in the media um, is that, you know, the media has silos which reflect the world outside. And so historically, your average, you know, media group has had a science desk, a markets desk, a political desk, um, you know, a, a corporate desk, and then it, and something like, you know, ESG accounting falls between all of them. Um, you know, and when, we, when we created Moral Money, we were the first mainstream media group to actually do something in a kind of joined up way to try and cover it, but that silo problem's there. But, you know, it's changing. There is growing interest. And the one thing I will say is that if you look, talk to business schools these days, um, the fastest way that they can get students to go to their audit courses is to slap the word green on it. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually a voracious demand amongst younger people for finding ways to connect these issues up. Um, and in many ways, that may be one of the ways to actually try to get not just the communication challenges, but also the wider sort of zeitgeist shift you need to support this. That's great. We're going to continue to count on you to be a part of making this message accessible and simple. Well, we're not, we're not evangelizing for it, let me say. <laughs> we're trying to illuminate it. So we're not shy about pointing out the problems, and there are many, many problems. Um, but what we need, first of all, is illumination. Terrific. Thank you. And I'm going to come to you, Manuel. And we've, we've heard different opinions here. And um, as you, you've had a week of almost reflections here, and you joined us, I think, in September 2019 in New York in the Sustainable Development Impact Summit. And um, I'd be very curious to hear, have you seen uh, the desire from corporate leaders to, to want to act more towards making the economy more sustainable and, and your reflections on how to translate some of that momentum into contributing to the process of creating the standards and really moving forward? And how can we help galvanize some of it? Thank you, Ramya. With lots of great questions. Have I seen a chance? Yes. Um, for me, there's no doubt that um, there are, I, let's put it this way, I don't think that today there are 
uh, CEOs of large companies at least that are not really wondering seriously about climate as a factor of stability, resilience, or performance of their companies, one way or the other, one way or the other. Um, the, what, what's absolutely missing, and I'm not saying this is, ne this is enough, but that, that is necessary, is that common language in order to be able to speak to their provider of capital, their bankers, insurers, and of course, investors about it. Um, where the conversation has changed as well is that I think that on the investor side, uh, or I'd say broadly speaking, the providers of capital side, uh, the Financial Stability Board um, is um, really looking at the climate issue as a stability topic. And they have that on their agenda and they're running you know, rigorous approaches on this. And the central banks, um, are, are right now pushing into the system their ability to understand in the portfolios of lending, collateral, guarantee, um, off balance sheet, investment, private and listed, where there is carbon and where there is not carbon. Um, the same goes for the asset owners themselves when they invest into, as Brian said, private equity or listed. Um, uh, asset managers. And so uh, there is an overarching uh, governance of the stability of the whole financial system that has embarked climate right now, and that wasn't the case a few years back. And that's really going to, I think, change materially um, the conversation here. Um, because they are clear that they need the granularity of company level disclosures on climate in order to make all the math of where all of this is going. Of course, there are governments and governments and um, um, I think jurisdictions will have different approaches on the priorities, on the speed at which it should go and, and the ways and means. Um, but more and more governments are making their own net determined contribution on climate. And they will turn to exactly what Brian said, business. Business is going to deliver it. and so. I'm, I'm saying all of this because I think that is the context in which we are now. We were not the same way a few years back. Now, um, challenges all over the place, it's clear. And for me, if I can um, summarize it, I think um, the, the response to which uh, ISSB was uh, created is one uh, that is trying to... Um, uh, make sure that the global baseline is ambitious enough to meet the requirements I've just described and therefore to move capital significantly, to move pricing significantly on ESG sustainability issues starting with climate, which is probably the less contentious or the most consensual topic that we have and seen as urgent by the majority of uh, uh, jurisdictions. Um, in, in a way that we are really supporting with the transparency of our disclosures, decision useful, uh, um, and, and therefore moving markets, because this is how companies will be able to attract the capital that they need for that transformation. The, by being ambitious this way, the risk is to not have the smaller entities, not have some countries that need to get there. So it's hugely important that, first of all, we are pragmatic. And where we say pragmatic is task for us by saying you only report what matters mm -hmm. to your company. You, you're, you're not reporting you know, everything. You, you pick and you choose for right reasons what matters and what doesn't. And the second is that we need proportionality. Uh, you can't uh, request the same thing from a you know, $10 million company and a $100 billion company. You can't. But you need to start with the $100 billion company because all its ecosystem will be embarked into the journey. And there is a huge, and I'll finish with that, there is a huge education, capacity building, training um, topic that is only starting to surface, including with the lack of talent um, around all of this. But to be very clear, I, I think again that in the 30s, um, you know, when accounting and gaps started, we were facing the same. Mm -hmm. And the only difference 
is that we don't have decades. I think we have years. But the other difference is that we have, made, we have now ways, digitals and many others, to attract the generation into this and into working with this, and Jillian was making reference to that, that I think is unparalleled with what happened before. So new challenges, new opportunities, and we're all about it. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I, um, we might have time for one question, but before that, Gillian, I, I, I want... I had a very quick thing was to say. I think one reason why journalists often think that ESG should stand for eye roll, sneer and groan was because in the past it was about activism. And often, you know, companies were seen as not living up to their, you know, any activist claims. Now it's really more about risk management. Um, and that's what's shifted. And, you know, in some ways, opportunity and realizing what's actually going to generate value in the future or not. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, we might have time for a question or two. So, can you please announce um, your name and your affiliation before the and sure. make the question brief, please, to the lady. Sure. I am Silvia Inio. I'm from the Global Shapers uh, in the Brussels Hub, which I'm curating, and I'm also working at the European Commission on Sustainable Finance. Uh, and I'm just curious to ask a little bit, like, whether you think that the kind of ambition of the work of the ISSB is going to be um, as ambition as ambitious as, you know, the net zero 2050 that we all wish for to, you know, avoid watering down ambitions that we've all kind of uh, worked on, at least in Europe uh, for the past uh, period. So I just wonder, you know, how are you thinking about alignment with also the work that we're carrying out in Europe? Notwithstanding that every country is different, of course. Thank you to you. That's me? To, uh, okay. To, go ahead. Okay, I'll start. Yeah, uh, uh, sure, thanks. Thank you for the question. I think that, um, the one clear uh, difference between ISSB and Europe is that Europe has gone for what is called, sorry for the others, dual materiality, which is not only uh, what matters for companies, as I just said, and their investors, but also what matters for society, even though that doesn't have a financial uh, materiality for the company itself, which is a, a, an absolutely sovereign choice that, um, you know, that Europe has made. So uh, we, are, we are one part of that, the financial materiality part. The alignment that we seek to have, and that is requested by so many, is on the financial materiality part, not on the other side. And there is no reason, when I look at climate and others, that, um, and specifically on climate, sorry, at least, that we shouldn't be aligned um, on, on the European and the European with the ISSB at, at this stage. There are a number of details of significant differences, but I think uh, the approach and the ambition on climate are the same in terms of the transparency and the level of disclosure. Ryan. Um, the ambition shouldn't be on the rules and disclosure. The ambition should be on doing stuff. And that's what we were trying to do with a straightforward set of metrics. We didn't ask people to create another set of metrics. So TCFD is one of the things, and people are already doing that. So is there ambition on the actual work? Yes. The, the net zero commitment by a company, uh, operating company, financial company, you pick it, is effectively an internal tax on the use of carbon across the whole company. So you don't need an external tax. You already put it on there. Because at the end of the day, if I can't get rid of carbon emissions, at the end of the day, I'm going to have to offset them, and that's going to be a sizable number. And so I tax everybody to deal with this point. But it's the ambition net zero which creates activity. The only way to get net zero not to cost me a lot of money at the end is to actually get the emissions down of my ones, twos, and threes. The only way to do that is actually go out and, and educate my supply chain about what I need from them to manual. So earlier point. So, one of the things we got to quit getting caught up is the ambition of rules and, you know, uh, principles. The, the ambition has to be on the action. Now, why we need these is because, a little bit what Dylan was said, we need to show society we're actually going to make progress on these goals. We have to have a way that they can measure your year moves. So we're in the second year of disclosing these goals. So if you get our annual report last year, you got it this year, you'll see the second year, you'll see it's right there on like pages 46 to 52. And you, know, and you can see it. And so take it out of environment, take it to uh, diversity. You can see our diversity disclosure. You know, our women uh, percentages are, you know, in the U.S. context, our uh, African-American percentages, our Asian percentage, our Hispanic percentage, our senior percentages, our board percentages. It's all there. And so if it doesn't move in the right direction, you're here, guess what? Why aren't you making progress? And you're starting to see that come out as companies disclose. So that's the ambition is to actually make the change. The rules will then enable people to recognize the change being made, not made in any investment consumer and other decisions come behind it. But I, I think we've got to get away from the idea, all the, it, despite the fact 
we challenge this, uh, him with a tough task, and a big task, an important task. We got to keep the, if you want to get to 2050, if you want to get Paris aligned, if you want to get diversity boards, if you want to get uh, uh, fair taxes paid, if you want to get all these things which are in the SDGs and the metrics, if you want that, the companies have got to go out and do it. And that's what we got to keep people's head. And that's what the metrics will illuminate is people who are actually doing it and people are talking about it. Thank you, Brian. Let's take a second question, the lady behind, and that'll be the last question we can take. So. Thank you, uh, Advas Haldinger with DevX, and my question is uh, on ISSB. Uh, we often in this conversation talk about really big companies um, and companies in the global north, uh, but a lot of the supply chain are companies that are much smaller and in the global south. How do you create a standard and then a system for implementing a standard that is fair and equitable across geographies and particularly in low-income countries? Yeah, and thanks for the question. Um, as I just said, I think that um, what, what we're trying to answer as, as a question and a request from the G20 leaders to start with and many others around them, and that includes the World Bank, the UN, the IMF, the OECD, um, is that question of a global baseline. Um, the level of ambition uh, is going to be high. So it's not a matter of having a minimum common denominator. It's a matter of being where we need to be, moving capital markets in the right direction. And but as I said, it's absolutely clear that we need proportionality, education, capacity buildings, and time. So it's an horizon. We don't have decades, but we probably have years in some cases. And so it's very important that um, because of that, we are probably going to embark with an ecosystem of partners that will also go beyond the pure standard setting. That's about education and capacity building. There may even be space for multilateral financing of such capacity building to help those countries, those companies in those countries to you know, have the game because they, we need them to be part of the inclusive supply chains of the bigger companies. We, don't, we can't cut economy in two. There's the you know, nice part of the economy and the rest of the world. That's global capital markets that function well and that's a gift to humanity, the whole, everyone. So that's one thing. It goes even beyond that. We are having conversations, including with some global south jurisdictions, about developing apps and digital solutions for the smaller companies that they don't even have to report because you know, instead of having them having a report, we know how metrics, uh, what their output of cement would be. Okay, you know, for a company that's 20 million uh, a cement company or construction company somewhere, you don't need to ha ask them all that. You just give us the output of cement and we know what the emissions factor are. And if maybe we are wrong by 10%, so be it. We will improve over time. So that's the level of pragmatism that I think we should you know, design that goes way beyond the pure standard setting in order to make sure that there is accessibility over time to everyone in this, uh, in, in, in this effort. So again, um, to be clear, if, if you, the SDGs were the UN, 195 companies, you know, uh, countries, excuse me, 190, whatever it was, and so if you follow that pattern, it ought to be what the world wants from sustainable development that is you know, sustainable energy for all, which we worked on with the UN over the years, uh, the supply chain up here, it's, it's embedded in the metrics and stuff. And so if you take like the fashion industry we have, uh, that we work with uh, and one of the efforts, you know, they are thinking about you know, cotton growth and how it works and sustainable cotton growth and then also thinking about you know, different kinds of materials and you know, non-leather materials and all these different things. That's because they're making commitments you know, wherever they are located, some of them are located in the south as actual enterprises, uh, global south, but they're making uh, commitments that then they gotta find out the things. And so the, there's actually an opportunity for the countries who, to, to change faster, the, the economies to change faster that are in the supply chain, because frankly, you can move them more quickly than you can an embedded base uh, of stuff that's harder to move, you know? And so you can say, if you do the farming this way, <coughs> You know, we can then use you in our supply chain. If you do it that way, can't. And then and you can go talk to them, and it's a relatively modest amount of money to move it along. So we're, we're, we're thinking about that as we, we do it. I'll just say one very quick thing is you are seeing quite a lot of innovative approaches from large um, Western companies um, in terms of providing credit 
and support for their supply chains to shift, precisely because they're under pressure because of scope three and they need to report their wider footprint mm -hmm. to actually act. So whether it's Walmart, whether it's Gigaton project, or whether it's some of the um, <coughs> food manufacturers trying to provide support and credit for their suppliers, you know, that is notable. The other quick thing is, as we have geopolitical tensions leading to a realignment of supply chains and so-called trendshoring, that ghastly word, um, companies are being forced to look at their supply chains again much more thoughtfully. And that, in many ways, I think is going to be one of the triggers because if companies are going to have to realign their supply chains anyway to, to make them more resilient in the face of geopolitical tension, um, that's going to actually be, a, if not an excuse, but a trigger to embed some wider sustainability ideas into any future supply chains. Thank you very much. I'm really sorry we're going to have to stop here. Thank, thank you all for joining us. Thanks to the panelists for excellent comments. So as Brian, you said, it's ambition that's going to drive and that's going to drive the actions. And thank you, Emmanuel, again for helping bring together the set of standards and continue to engage on this topic. Follow us at reforum.org, stakeholder capitalism. Thank you.